These are all meeting this week. Those details are under the week at a glance uh, heading there in your bulletin on the middle page. No home groups on the fourth or fifth Sundays of the month, so that means tonight is the final home group for the month of October, so take note of that. And one date to note is the fall festival coming up. That's going to be a week from Wednesday. That'll be October 25th, and that as well will be at the South Campus. Uh, so fall festival coming up here in, in about a week and a half. Three serving needs. We talked about these uh, last week, but they're on the back of your bolt in there. You can see details about that. Uh, children's ministry, decor and events, and cleaning rotation. So if you're looking for a way to, to use uh, to serve and use your gifts, you can prayerfully consider being a part of one of those opportunities. So those are just a few of the highlights from the bulletin this week, uh, but make sure and read all the details there. There are more, more announcements that we can't cover at this point. So I'm going to ask you to stand and we'll pray for our time together. Father, we are a grateful people this morning, and grateful first and foremost that our, our gratitude and our joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Your people are often an afflicted people and a suffering people, and many of us are going through circumstances that we would not choose if we were sovereign, and yet our joy and gratitude can remain because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if our hope and our trust and our joy is in him, then it can't be touched by even the most painful circumstances, so we are thankful for that this morning, for our salvation in Christ, that he bore the wrath that we so richly deserve. May our worship this morning reflect that gratitude as well. And we think of Alex and the music team and, and Pastor Mark as they have prepared this past week and, and practiced this past week to serve us well. And even though that preparation and practice is appropriate, our trust is not in those things. And we know that their trust is not in those things. Our trust is in you and you alone to do the type of work that only you can do in our midst. So we pray that you would accomplish that work this morning, that you would save the lost in our midst, that, that sinners would be saved, that you would edify the church, that, that the saints would be, would be encouraged and built up in the truth, and also um, overall that Christ would be exalted in our hearts. He would be adored in the hearts of your people this morning. We pray to that end in Christ's name. Show. 
morning comes from Isaiah, chapter 53, Isaiah 53, we'll read all the words of our Lord from the pen of Isaiah, here's what is said, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He who has no stately form or majesty, that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he did not open his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He was grie- his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded. For the transgressors. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord, we come to a text like this and we marvel. We marvel that the King of glory had to come to this earth and to be treated in such lowly estate. You were came in such a way that you had no stately form or appearance. You had no majestic form that we would look upon and see your great glory. For indeed, all of your eternal glory was cloaked in your frail humanity. You came and bore our wrath. You bore our punishment. You bore the wrath reserved for many. Indeed, a marvelous work that you would come and be stricken by men, that you would be mocked and forsaken, that you would be a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, that you would face the suffering that was rightly due us. We come this morning marveling at your wondrous work, that you would pour out such great love and affection for a people who cared not about you, who desired not to glorify you, but to exalt themselves we marvel that you would show great love to your enemies. And we pray this morning that our hearts would be opened to manifest the same kind of compassion, that we would love the unlovely, that we would show grace and mercy to those who are undeserving, that we would show the love of God to sinners, just as we have received. We pray this morning, open our eyes to the glories of the cross, open our eyes to the significance of those final moments, so that as we see them, we would apply them first in our home life, that our family lives would be rich with gospel truth, that parents would lovingly proclaim the gospel to their children, that children would embrace gospel truth and live for the glory of God. And we pray for the church life, that you would take the same redemptive work and make us a fragrance of your redemptive accomplishments. 
Prepare our hearts and minds this morning as we look at your truth. For your kingdom's sake we pray. Amen. I'm ask the men to come forward for our time of offering.
of agape love. So all forgiveness flows out of a love. And it is an unconditional release. We give it to the, the, the offender unconditionally. We're not looking for any form of payment. We're not looking for them to grovel. We're not looking for them to pay us back in some way. In fact, they cannot pay us back in some way. It's impossible for them to pay us back in any way. And it's lavished upon the offender because God himself lavished us with grace. He, by removing our impossible debt. Those are the key ideas that we understand when we come to forgiveness. We seek to unconditionally release sinners of their sin debt because God has done the same for us. Now, to understand this, and here's where much of the confusion comes into in the doctrine of forgiveness, is that forgiveness is applied to us in many different contexts. We apply forgiveness all the time in all kinds of different contexts. How you treat your little ones at home or how you treat your grandchildren is different than how the court systems treat us. How God treats us judicially is different than how God treats us in sanctification. This is the difficulty when it comes to this idea of forgiveness is that we're trying trying to apply it in the same way in all the different contexts where it is uh, called for and it's difficult to do that. And so what I've wanted to kind of do for you is to show you that we can be forgiving all the time. And we must be unconditionally forgiving all the time. Because this forgiveness is an act of our character. I want you to understand this. And when we forgive, we forgive as an act of our moral reflection of God. We are acting in character. Just to kind of highlight, you remember back to Matthew 18... Remember in that the parable, the unforgiving servant? Remember when that servant was brought before his, lo- his Lord and he had this impossible debt, you know, 10,000 talents he had to pay for, and he pleaded with his Lord, Lord, give me more time. And the response in Matthew 18, verse 27, it says, And the Lord felt compassion for his servant, and he forgave him the debt. What was the reason why the Lord forgave his, the debt of the servant? Is because the Lord had compassion The Lord of the servant had a love for him, and out of that love, he expressed compassion in the example of forgiveness towards the servant. That word compassion is used many times in the New Testament, 12 times in fact. You might want to look to Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. You see the prodigal son there. And when the prodigal son is returning, it says the father felt compassion for him. It's the same thing. So the idea is this, is that out of a great love for the sinner, you forgive. God loves. And out of his his character of love, he is gracious towards sinners. I want to make that clear. Because in regards to us expressing forgiveness towards others, we we express it out of an act of our character. Because it is a reflection of God's character himself. Here's where, again, many get stuck. We get stuck in the idea of forgiveness to say, well, if I am forgiving somebody, does it mean that they are entirely forgiven of all of their transgressions? And that's not the case. I can be forgiving somebody, but they still have to repent. They still have to receive the full benefits of my forgiveness. This is kind of the rub. This is the, the difficulty in this doctrine. I can begin to pray for a sinner. I can begin to privately release them. And yet, they still have responsibility to come confess their sin. They still have the responsibility, as 2 Corinthians 7, to repent of their sin in turn. They haven't received all the full benefits of my forgiveness yet. Now, somebody, if you're thinking through this carefully, and I read through Chris Braun's book, Uh, unpacking forgiveness, and you would recognize, he would say, well, aren't we just talking semantics here? Chris Bronze would say this, when you give forgiveness, here's what you do. You offer it like a gift. It's like a nice little packaged gift. The sinner, the offender has to grab it from you and rip it open and take it out, and then he has forgiveness. If he doesn't take it from you, he doesn't have forgiveness. You offered it freely, you offered it unconditionally, you gave it to him, but he doesn't have it until he opens it up and he takes it out and then he has forgiveness. And I have one little problem or distinction with that. It means this, then 
unless he opens that gift and takes it out by repentance, unless he receives it, you're not forgiving until he does that. And that's my problem. Because the Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible tells us to be forgiving all the time. It tells us when you're praying, you forgive. It, you, it tells us that we are constantly to be forgiving. And it's how is it that I can be forgiving if he won't open up the gift, if he won't repent, if he won't take of it? And that's why I say this. Our forgiveness is an act independent of what anyone else does. We can be forgiving. Independent of what anyone does, we can be forgiving from the heart. It doesn't matter what the offender does, we can be praying for them. It doesn't matter what the offender does, we can be actively seeking their best. It doesn't matter what the offender does, we can demonstrate a desire to show full reconciliation. It doesn't matter what the offender does, we can call them to repentance and faith. It doesn't matter what they do, we can choose to as much as it depends upon us to be at peace with all men. It doesn't matter what he does, we choose to cover debt. We choose to remove it. We choose to cast it off because we love unconditionally. But the sinner must take it. The sinner must repent. The sinner must obey God to enjoy all the full benefits of forgiveness. The sinner must obey all that God has called him to if he's going to have the fullness of forgiveness and enjoy the sweetness of reconciliation and restoration. The sinner still has to do his part. And again, this is a lot of where the rub is on forgiveness because we think, well, if I forgive him, then he doesn't have to do anything. He just gets away with it. And I just have to accept it and I just have to be okay with them sinning. Well, no, that's not the case at all. You express forgiveness and in your expressing of forgiveness, you're calling them to repentance. And when they come to repentance, they experience the fullness of that forgiveness. Their repentance didn't make you forgiving Their repentance revealed the depth of what your forgiveness is. How do I know all that? Well, it's illustrated for us very plainly here in Luke 23. Luke 23, 33 through 43. We see this this practice of forgiveness richly demonstrated for us. So I'm just going to walk you through this narrative and, and highlight some things as we work through it and then draw out some implications for us at the end. Notice, first of all, the context of redemptive love in verse 33. Here's what Luke records. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Stop right there. And it's interesting in Luke's comments there. Luke just records the death or the crucifixion of Christ in very simple terms. Actually, surprisingly simple for the background that Luke had as a doctor. You would imagine a doctor going into more details in regards to the effects of the physical trauma that Jesus faced, but none of that is there. Luke just simply goes into and reveals his audience here, in fact. He says they just came to the place called the skull. Here, Luke translates the name. We know from Matthew's account that this place is called Golgotha. Your Bible may even have the term Calvary there. The idea here, this is the place where criminals were judged. Criminals were brought here to be crucified. This is the place of capital punishment. Christ then was brought as a common thief, a common criminal, to this place of judgment to be, as the text says, crucified. They crucified him there on the spot. Now, just getting the implications of all this, as you would go back through the Gospels, you'll recognize that Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night because the people were, or the religious leaders were afraid of the people and knew that if they had arrested him during the day, that there would be some kind of uprising. So they arrested him in the middle of the night. On top of that, they had a a trial in the middle of the night. This violated the law of the Jews. He was to have a public hearing. They didn't give him that honor. He had a private hearing behind the scenes, and they were to come up with some kind of false charges. You also remember that the final charge that they gave is that he, he had said that he would... If you destroyed the temple in three days, he would raise it up. And they used that as the form of blasphemy for a reason why they would ultimately judge him and turn him over to the Romans. This was a man filled with blasphemy. He was a man who was going to destroy the temple. He is a man who made himself equal with God. And therefore, he was a blasphemer. 
turned over to then the Romans who mocked him, who ultimately crucified him here, led him to this place called Golgotha, drove nails into his feet and hands and lifted him up on the cross. And Luke says that in very simple terms here, they crucified him. Luke adds one little detail that there were criminals there, one criminal on his left and his other criminal on his right. The form of crucifixion was a form of punishment that ultimately would lead to the death of its victims by them being able to not breathe anymore. They'd be asphyxiated. They would not be able to breathe because their bodies would become tired, worn down, and eventually they would pass out. Here, then again, Christ is treated like these common criminals. Notice then, the next section, verse 34a, the act of redemptive love. Notice what our Lord says. Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is the act of redemptive love. Now, one of the obvious questions would be, well, who is Jesus praying for here? If he is praying for forgiveness, whom does he pray for? And some have said, well, he prays for uh, the Jews uh, because ultimately they're the ones who led him there. Others have said, well, he's praying for all the bystanders, the crowds that are around there who are gawking and watching what's taking place. Still others say, well, he's praying specifically for the Roman soldiers who are going through the process of crucifying him and have hung him there on the cross. I particularly take the stance that he's praying for the people in the immediate context there. So both the crowds and particularly the Roman soldiers. If you say as well, it goes to the Jews, fine, I'll agree with you there too. But it's obvious that at least in this context, that those who are there, the ones who he's praying for, are the Roman soldiers and that immediate crowd who mocks him. And they're going to come up here in the next few verses. This is who Jesus is praying for. Now, I want to point something else out to you. Notice the statement again, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, Isn't that a strange statement? You say, well, yeah, it is strange because he's dying and he's making this. And indeed, that is strange for that reason as well, that he would have a kind of love that even in the face of dying at the hands of these Roman soldiers would be asking for forgiveness. But it's even more strange for this. When has Jesus ever in his earthly ministry asked the Father for the right and privilege to forgive a sinner? It just didn't happen. Let me just point out a couple of times to you. Turn over to Matthew chapter 9. I'll just point this out. There are many places this was demonstrated. I'll just point out a couple. The first out of Matthew's gospel. In Matthew chapter 9, you remember a paralytic was brought to Jesus. Jesus who had been out with his disciples. He had just cast out demons and he had come, you know, where he had come to the other side of the sea and a a demonic man came out and he cast out demons and the demons went into the swine and and fled into the sea. Jesus got in the boat, he went to the other side of the sea and and verse 2 says of Matthew chapter 9 that they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed and seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, take courage son, notice, your sins are forgiven. I want you to notice what's not said there. Take courage, son. I asked the father and he gave permission that you should be forgiven. It's not what's said there. It's simply stated, your sins are forgiven. I forgive you. Your sins have been cast off. Then, of course, you remember the whole discussion uh, that, uh, that takes place here. They said uh, in their hearts, who is this guy who can do this? He says, verse 5, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. Now, verse 6, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to do what? To forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, go home. What's happening here? Jesus, on his own prerogative, demonstrates his authority to forgive sinners. And he forgives on the spot. Because why? He has the authority to do that. It's clear because of the miraculous power that he demonstrates after that. Jesus had the ability to forgive sinners on the spot. And he didn't certainly need to seek permission from the Father to do that. Turn over to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 7. We saw this as we looked at 
uh, Luke 7. You remember the account in Luke 7 where Jesus was invited to the Pharisee's house for a uh, meal where he had to give an account to Simon and to the other Pharisees uh, about what his ministry was about. And as he was there, uh, a woman in the area had heard about this meal and she decided to come to it. And she had a reputation of being a sinner. And you remember what Jesus does there. She's weeping over him and cleansing uh, his feet with her tears and anointing him with perfume. It says in Luke 7 verse 48, then he turned to her and he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Again, notice what's not stated there. He's not saying, I asked the father if I had the permission to forgive you. He just simply forgives her sins on the spot. He regularly forgave. Didn't have to seek permission. He didn't have to ask the father to do it. It was something that he had the right to do, something that he had the prerogative to do, to demonstrate forgiveness on the spot. That happens again many times throughout Christ's account. Now turn back to Luke 23. This is now strange. What, in verse 34, what is Jesus doing here when he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If up to this whole point, the earthly ministry of Christ has been Christ demonstrating the power to forgive and the willingness to forgive sinners, which he did multiple times in the Gospels, what's happening here? Now you understand why some scribes say, okay, this verse just doesn't belong. It doesn't make any sense. We'll just cut it out. Well, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. I'll give you an answer. Just hold on to that question. Let's continue here in this. Jesus is demonstrating something here. Let's go on to the next section, what Jesus does here. Or, or what we see is the need for redemptive love. Notice as the verse continues, and they were casting lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging there with the, uh, hanging there was hurling abuse at him saying, "Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us." This is the need for redemptive love demonstrated here in this context. Christ was being abused from every angle. You had the soldiers taking his clothing before him and dividing them before him. You had the people, the onlookers, the, the gawking crowd standing on the side. John adds that they're sitting there wagging their head at him as they were throwing their insults at him. Save yourself. You saved others. You were able to deliver others. You're able to get rid of the sin of others. Why can't you save yourself? If you are the Son of God, if you are the Messiah, if you are the one that has been prophesied of, then demonstrate it at this time. Come off of the cross. That was the mocking. And if that wasn't enough, you remember that Pilate had put above him the inscription, this is the king of the Jews. A mockery. Entire, entire mockery of his life. Verse 35, the people were sneering at him, casting abuses and insults, mocking Christ. Soldiers even got into this whole act. Oh, if you are a king, well, let me give you wine, king. And they offered up sour wine to him, the bitter mocking. And if that's not enough, then the common criminals who are hanging there with him are mocking him. I mean, verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. I mean, okay, you've got the crowds mocking you, the authorities, the Roman authorities mocking you, and then your fellow criminals who are there on the cross dying with you are also mocking you. I mean, this is an intense trial. And what is it? It's simply this. Prove yourself. Prove yourself to be who you say you are. Vindicate yourself. Demonstrate that you are indeed the Christ. 
The temptation is take matters into your own hands. Stop believing upon the Father that he would deliver you. And prove by your own power and your own authority that you are the Christ. That's the trial, the difficulty. In it, the abuses were cast at him. Now notice the application of redemptive love. Verse 40 through 43. But the other answered, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Here is the application of redemptive love. You had Christ being mocked by everyone around, even the fellow criminal. And the other criminal responds, What are you doing? Why are you mocking him? Notice the heart of this criminal in verse 40. Don't you even fear God? You're under the same condemnation as God. The the kind of faith that this criminal had. He is basically saying that he believed in Christ. That Christ was innocent. That Christ was there wrongly. He recognized Christ's innocence and called out to his fellow criminal and called him to account for it. Here's in essence what this criminal was saying. The one who recognized Christ's innocence. He's saying this, Jesus, save me. When he asks, in verse 42, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom, he is in essence asking, Lord, save me. Remember me in your kingdom. He had faith. He had faith ultimately in a resurrection as he's about to face death. He had faith in a future work of God as Christ was going to establish a kingdom. He had faith in a restoration that God's work was going to be accomplished. He had faith in Christ's innocence. He had faith in Christ's works and accomplishment. He had faith ultimately in Christ himself. And then the wonderful promise, verse 43. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now, again, back to the question at hand. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange in verse 43 that he didn't say, Truly I say to you, wait a minute, let me go ask the Father if this is okay. Father, is this okay? Okay, yes, it is okay. Here, you are with me in paradise. No, no, he simply says here on the spot, today you are forgiven. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will receive the reward. What has taken place here at the cross? You have what's taken place, the evidence of the Son of Man forgiving as the perfect man and the Son of God forgiving as God. At the same event, again, going back to the details of verse 34a, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. You have in this occurrence Jesus turning over his rights uh, as God, uh, turning over his rights as a man saying, God, you can do with them as you please. Here, Jesus is operating as a man, as a man under the law, a man under his father's judgment, a man bearing the punishment of sins for humanity. I mean, this is one of the best examples and descriptions of Christ being the perfect sacrifice for us. He went to the cross as one of us to bear our sin. And as he went to the cross, as one of us, he turned over any rights and prerogatives that he had to the Father to let the Father direct. That's significant. What you have in Mark, or in Luke 23, verse 34, when Jesus is praying for their forgiveness, you have the perfect reflection of Mark 11:25. When you stand praying, forgive anyone who has anything against anyone so that your Father will also forgive Jesus is demonstrating, verse 34, what it means to be the perfect suffering servant who went to the cross seeking deliverance 
for man. He demonstrated that love for others. He demonstrated that great concern, that he was willing to seek their best interest, willing to withhold our, no judgment or with any right to seek judgment. He's willing to, to withhold punishment from anyone. In fact, in verse 34 there, it's significant as he's praying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. He's praying, I want their best. For all of these people harming me, for all of these ones who brought me here, whether it was for the false trial that I had, the arresting in the middle of the night, the abuses from all the bystanders, whether it was the abuses from the Roman soldiers, whether it was the mocking that I'm receiving from this fickle crown, I want their best. I want them to exalt you. I want them to be restored to you, Father. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. In essence, you can say this. He's saying, Father, I turn them over to you to do whatever you will to do with them. If they repent and believe and are forgiven, I withheld any rights to judgment. And if you forgive them, I will rejoice with you. That's the idea here. And then turn over to verse 43. As the criminal comes to him in faith and believing, he says to him, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. What is he demonstrating here is the full forgiveness of the criminal. Because there's faith, there's repentance, there's belief. And immediately he's fully forgiven and able to enter into eternal life. These are significant events, friends, to see here. There's the Son of God and the Son of Man demonstrating human forgiveness and divine forgiveness at the same event. Let's just reconcile this for a moment. Consider the implications. Jesus shows for us how we are to treat our enemies. We pray for them. We pray for their best. We pray that God would forgive them. We pray that they would see their sins and repent and turn. We pray that they would be set free. We turn over any rights that we may have to try to collect the debts and we turn it over to God, believing the best that God will direct. We have faith in God and his work. And then we recognize here that our responsibility is not nullified by somebody else's forgiveness. I mean, that's the key from this text. If Jesus, praying to his Father, delivered us from any responsibility, then both of the criminals were saved. But that wasn't the case here, was it? One criminal went to death in condemnation because he didn't believe upon Christ. Another believed upon Christ, declared his innocence, protected his innocence, and that time even asked for deliverance and received it. The key is recognizing here, our forgiveness does not nullify somebody's responsibility to repent and believe. And we see that clearly again in this context. If you do not believe upon Christ, you will not receive the forgiveness of your sins. If you do not believe and turn and follow him, you will not receive the full benefits of forgiveness. We can say it like this, everybody who ends up in hell ends up there not because God was unwilling to forgive, not because God was unable to forgive, but because man was unwilling to embrace in repentance and faith the forgiveness that God was offering. It's the same for us. In every relationship we have, may it be that relationships are broken not because we withhold forgiveness, but because the sinner will not repent and turn. We can show forgiveness in a lot of different ways, as I've said. Small, seemingly insignificant ways to big, grand, public ways. And we should. We should be regularly praying for the unrepentant. We should be regularly desiring their best interest. We should be doing everything we can within our power to show them the love of God so that when their judgment comes, if they are unrepentant, it comes in its fullness, not because we've withheld something, but because of the hardness of their own heart and their unwillingness to reconcile. And we pray, if they reconcile, that we get the opportunity to show them the fullness of our forgiveness, that they have the full and sweet demonstrations that we could even say, like Jesus says to that thief on the cross, you will be with us, we'll have fellowship. 
This is the kind of forgiveness demonstrated in the cross that is a model example for us. Jesus demonstrated he was seeking reconciliation by seeking forgiveness for sinners. And then when at that very moment, I mean, just think about this for a moment. If Jesus wasn't preparing his heart for the opportunity to love someone else, what would happen when he saw these little, uh, this expression of faith by this criminal? What happens in the human heart when we're not prepared to respond in love to others? When somebody does finally turn and ask, we're not prepared to love them. I can say this. When it comes down to personal relationships, let's just imagine you've been sinned against. Let's imagine somebody took something from you, harmed you in some way. If you're not regularly praying for them, desiring their best interest, when they come and repent, when they come and seek your uh, reconciliation and restoration, you're not going to be prepared to love them because you're still going to be thinking about the way they hurt you. But when your heart is already sensitive to their repentance, when you're already forgiving them in your heart and seeking their best interest, when you're already taking them before God and praying that God would be uh, forgiving them, then when they do repent, you're going to be sensitive and ready to immediately respond and show them what they need. That's exactly what took place here with Christ. As he's praying... In verse 34, forgive him. He had the immediate opportunity while he was there to show them that forgiveness. I'm praying that's what the Lord will do for us. When we come back next week, we're going to look at then the grand gospel implications of forgiveness. All right, then what is it that God is doing in forgiving and reconciling himself with the world? We'll see that out of Luke 24 next week. Let's pray. incredible implications for us. When we look at Christ and his incarnational perfect son of God, there's 100% human and 100% God. Marvel that even coming to the cross, he submits his will to your plan, Father, that he submits entirely in faith, believing that you will protect him believing that you would vindicate him, believing that you would lift him up, believing that he had to take no authority into his own hands, but he can entrust himself to you to protect and to deliver. And I pray, Father, for us, that we would have the same kind of faith, that we would believe you above all else, that we believe your words, that you can vindicate us, you could deliver us. And when we've been sinned against, that we would be the kind of people who lovingly care for others, who, who quickly approach you in prayer, seeking their forgiveness, and we desire restoration and reconciliation. We pray you do your work in the sinner, that all of our relationships would be healthy and strong. In those times, may we see Christ in the sufferings that he went through as our model example to persevere and to endure through the difficulties. And in all of this, may all of us have the sweet rewards of fellowship with one another because we know sins have been cast off. Thank you for this wonderful privilege we received in Christ to have communion with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We'll ask you to stand and ask Joe to come close us in a word of prayer. bow together in prayer. Lord, as we have heard this message, we know that there are some within the sound of my voice that have yet to humble themselves like the thief on the cross. They have yet to admit their sin, yet to admit their need for redemption through Christ, their need to repent and follow Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you will use the message of the gospel, the truth that was presented today, to convict those who are still in their sin or without Christ. Those of us who are in Christ who have, in fact, been redeemed, been reconciled because of the blood of Christ, may we be used as examples of practicing reconciliation.
by taking the initiative to ask forgiveness, to willingly forgive those who have hurt us as well. May we go out and represent you as your ambassadors this week. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Go in the love of Christ this week. Thank you.